Hello, my friends. Welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanna LaFleur, and you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast. Week after week, we're coming at you with conversations with creatives and communicators all about how to communicate the best news in the world, but in the digital age. Thanks so much for watching, checking out this episode. If you want to know more, you want to check out more of our free resources, go to wordmadedigital.com or browse around this YouTube channel and you're definitely going to find some content that will help you. And of course, thank you so much to our sponsors, Compassion Canada and Wycliffe College are making this podcast possible. Enjoy the interview. Paul Burns, welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm really uh, just glad to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Can you introduce yourself to us? Give give us the picture of your world or your work. Yeah. So uh, so my name's Paul Burns. I I lead the team at uh, Twitter uh, here in Canada. Um, I think everyone probably knows what what Twitter is, but. Uh, but yeah, I lead the team here in Canada. I've been doing that for the last uh, several years, and um, uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's an exciting time to be in a tech organization that is uh, very much so at the forefront of free speech and politics and news and um, faith. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Well, and how how did you land there? I mean, this is a big role. There's a lot of influence in this role, at least in the Canadian context, if not beyond. Um, do you have a tech background? Where did where did you land into this from? Yeah, I I, um, I used to run a digital agency uh, many many years ago. It was called Huge, and uh, you know we had a fairly big team here in Toronto. It was a global agency headquartered out of Brooklyn, New York, and. Um, yeah, we did. We did work for brands like Apple, uh, Nike, um, you know, Google, uh, and some some of the most ambitious brands in the world hired us to build their future product roadmap. And so, um, so we got to work on some really cool things. And then one day, I got a phone call, and uh, it was someone saying, "Hey, uh, Twitter is looking for someone to run their Canadian operations. Would you be interested?" And, uh, and so that, that, those types of roles don't, uh, don't come up too often. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I thought about it deeply. I, I prayed about it like crazy and, um, it, uh, I started down the path of just exploring this company and going through the process of meeting the people, you know, you, you learn a lot about a company when you meet their executives and, uh, you know, um, they flew me down to, to many locations to have interviews with people. And um, yeah, after a long process, I felt like it was the right choice to jump in at a time that was, um, you know, just the, the way social media was influencing culture and influencing our society. I kind of thought, and I think God just put this on my heart, that this was a good moment to be able to play a role there and influence mm. maybe the future of where our company's going. So, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a cool journey so far. Well, and so how many years in has this been? Almost three years. So okay, yeah, almost three, three years, years so far. Yeah. So, but I would say the last year has been the wildest and the craziest. So, which feels like well, three years in one. <laughs> can we talk, can we talk about it? Because Twitter has been in the news a few times in uh, 2021 <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. um, for yes, shutting some people, <laughs> for closing some people down off the platform. Um, you know, obviously like prominent political, both like Trump is obviously the big name, but also, you know, people are in his orbit. Um, um, how do you, how, how are you wrestling with that conversation as an organization? Um, can, maybe, can you, can you give us a little, because some people are going to not really know what I'm talking about, but most people should that, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's a user agreement to use a platform that if you violate, you've been removed. How do we wrestle with that in a conversation about political figures and free speech? And I'm, I ask, it's a huge question, but, but tell us a little bit about what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. So, well, let me just say what, what is Twitter, you know, for maybe the people that don't understand what Twitter is. Twitter is what we like to call the conversation layer of the internet. And, and really at the core of what 
I think our intention is, is to have a vibrant, healthy, public conversation about the things that matter today to people. Where, where other social media platforms may be different is, you know, these, these are platforms where in many ways this is a chance to broadcast yourself. Um, this is a, you know, Instagram is a, is a good example of um, a platform that I would say predominantly feels like, I love Instagram and I use it a lot, but it predominantly feels like a, a platform that is look at me. Um, it's a chance for people to broadcast a, vi a, a version of yourself to the external world. Um, and Twitter is a little different than that. that. That does exist on Twitter, but Twitter is really about look at this. Look at this thing that's happening in the world and let's talk about this thing. And that could be news, that could be politics, that could be sports, that could be entertainment. Um, you know, news breaks on Twitter. Um, and so in many ways, it's faster than most journalists. It's, it's, this is the place where journalists go to find out what's happening in the world. Um, so it's, and it's got a real time nature to it. And so naturally politics is a big topic on Twitter. It's so it always has been. Um, and you know, Donald Trump, it was his primary mechanism for having conversations with, you know, with, with people. And so, um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say over the last year, we've we've had a, a pretty amazing, crazy roller coaster ride of ups and downs. Um, you know, whether it be things like the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, things like the presidential election, things like COVID nineteen. <laughs> uh, you know, all of these things uh, were major, major sort of cultural phenomenons that were happening in the world that everyone was pretty leaned into. And so um, so our role in being this sort of public conversation becomes a, uh, a role of how do we make sure that, you know, conversations are existing on the platform, but they're also their healthy conversations. Um, and I would say one of our top priorities at Twitter is the health of the public conversation. And even if you asked, if you think about that, topic, what, what constitutes a healthy conversation, um, you know, uh, that, that definition has changed over the last years many, many times. And so, uh, especially when we have political figures, um, you know, and whatever side of the political aisle you are on, I think, you know, where, where we land often is how do we ensure that we are giving people the options to make the right decision for, for them? Um, and so, content that's on the platform, you know, content that people are sharing out, uh, what we ask ourselves the question, what, where is the, the balance between freedom of expression? You can say absolutely whatever you want versus what's our responsibility to make sure that accurate information is getting portrayed to the world. And, uh, you know, I, I think we try and do our, the best job that we can uh, on these topics. We try and uh, make principled, thoughtful decisions on uh, on what makes sense and what what is in service of the public conversation. But yeah, you know, sometimes we don't make the right decisions, and so and we we will be the first ones to say, you know, in a very humble way, um, yeah, maybe sometimes we get it wrong. Uh, but I think that the intention is to um, serve the public conversation and make sure that those conversations are healthy. Um, and so that's that's been the journey the last year when you've got COVID-19, when it broke early in 2020, there was a ton of information out there. And a lot of it was, you know, I think people, citizens were trying to go, how do I make sense of this? You know, what 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 right. is accurate? What is right? Is this, is should I be concerned about this? Shouldn't I be? Um, and so a lot of our efforts were meant to try and make sure that people had, um, you know, reliable sources of information on this. Uh, we also, you know, went through a series of protests and, you know, racial injustice that happened. You know, how do we, how do we, how do we process that? How do we make sense of that, um, you know, on the platform? And then the, the, the U.S. election, you know, a lot of debates on election integrity and, you know, a lot of debates on, you know, was, was the election stolen? Was it fair? Um, and so a lot of our intentions behind some of the actions we make were based on how do we make sure that we give people options we give people choices and um so that's some of the thinking that goes into you yeah. know how we make decisions and and it i would just say it is not a these are very complex conversations they're not simple conversations they're not binary and happening yes or in no. real time 
Like, I mean, decisions are like posts are going out second by second and the team at Twitter is making decisions you know, every, I mean, it, it may be in some cases, it's every five minutes, a decision would have to be made in some cases or, you know, day by day in probably other cases of what to do with this content that's on our platform that we're responsible at some level for uh, the users. I think for the Christian, amongst others, the concern is, it, it's that, I always think of that quote of, you know, it's from in you know Nazi Germany, well they t- they went they came for the communists, and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't ca- I didn't say anything. And they came for this group of people. I don't know what the I'm butchering the quote, but the point is, until they came for all these other people, and I didn't say anything, and then they came for me. There was no one to speak for me, and and it's an extreme example. But I think the the fear behind it for a Christian is, would there be a day? And it's not hard to imagine that. Um, because, uh, you know, Christians or any religious group would hold certain viewpoints um, that were, were going to um, be shoved off or silenced in some way. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not under the, I don't think the church is being persecuted in America. I'm not of that camp whatsoever. But um, there is that fear, I think, that, 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 censorship can bring up these kinds of concerns, not for today, maybe, but the where are we going kind of a question. And maybe we don't know where we're going. But but what what do you think about that as a Christian grappling with these questions under the humility of trying to make decisions in the moment? Yeah, um, it's it's a good it's a good question. And it's a it's a great topic about, you know, the role of Christians in this you know, in this season that we're in, you know, and I, I see one camp of, of believers and Christians who are, you know, we got to hold our ground, stand firm, stand up for what we believe in. We will fight hard. Then there's another camp, which is, um, I would say, uh, perhaps passive is not the right word, but perhaps a, um, you know, we're not, we're not the type of people to, to be, you know, holding our ground and out fighting. It's, it's, we're just gonna, we're, we're, we're less bothered by the things that are happening in the world. And so there's, there's two very real camps. I think what's, what's happening here is, and we could probably all appreciate this, that, you know, in all of these things, and I think social media specifically, uh, nuance is such an important part of a conversation. It's such an important part of, you know, why we believe what we believe. Um, when, when people have opinions on a topic, um, you know, nuance is, is we live in nuance. It's, it's, you know, it's, we're swimming in it every day. And, and yet I think social media doesn't do a great job of allowing for nuance. Um, you know, it doesn't allow us to respect it, uh, or, um, it, it, it rewards in many ways, social media, that is binary conversations where, you know, that one, uh, sort of condemning outrageous tweet uh, or post that'll be the one that gets a million likes and a thousand and one retweets and you know um, so we incentivize these sort of sometimes inflammatory big bold statements that are very one dimensional when in reality you know um, for someone to say yes that might be true but I would also like us to pay attention to the fact that you know that type of stuff doesn't really work in social media, you know? And so we we tend to, um, I think, be in a position where, you know, where um, we don't, we don't provision for that. What I think as a Christian, I do think that um, I have opinions on all this stuff. You know, I have opinions on the U.S. election. I have opinions on, you know, the way Christian believers um, sort of declare uh, things publicly. I have a way, I have a belief and a hard, you know, a very heartfelt, sincere thought around most of what's happening politically in, in our world right now. Um, I, I don't know that I choose to jump into the conversation on those topics. And so my stance has always been to uh, try and do more listening than, than talking. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of opinions about a lot of things um, and I, I just don't think people come to know Jesus based on our opinions. I think, uh, I think in many yeah. ways they can block people from seeing Jesus. And so I, I really try and make sure that as we're, as we're trying to wrestle with some really 
difficult topics, some topics that are kind of scary to talk about sometimes. Um, you know, I ask myself the question, am I reflecting the heart of Christ? You know, mm-hmm. you know, we're called to look like him and be like him and act like him. And I, you know, I think about that and I think about that, you know, did, 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 did Christ on his way, this, this may not be the best example, but did Christ on his way to Golgotha, you know, stop and, uh, you know, uh, protest the injustice that's being done to him? Um, no, he didn't. Um, and, and so in many ways, I think about, you know, a lot of the conversations around how these, you know, for Christians being persecuted today, or the sense that there's a lot of injustice happening to us. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm of the opinion, and maybe this is just me that, you know, um, the light we're light, we're called to be, you know, light in the darkness. And if it gets darker, you know, it's going to get darker. Um, and, yeah. but I know that God can, God can, God's power can be revealed even in defeat and even in those moments of darkness. And it just doesn't stress me out the way, uh, you know, I think it, it, I've seen some people get totally bent out of shape on a topic or an issue and they lose their whole semblance, their whole decorum because something went a certain way or uh, some political uh, issue happened. And I, I just think, you know, God is just calling us to, you know, look like him and be like him and have the heart of Christ in these moments. And um, mm. I don't know. I think that's how I'm trying to process. This is a long winded way of answering your question. No, I think I get it's, it. yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, like just looking like Jesus in every situation. It's funny, you know, when you when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze an apple, you you get apple juice. Um, you know, when you squeeze a Christian, um, it should be weird for us as believers that oftentimes we don't see Christ in those moments. And so, um, and so that's, I, I think about that often is just how am yeah. I showing up in the moments where I may disagree with something? Um, you know, do I, should I, should I, am I trying to be right? Uh, or am I just trying to be loving and kind? Um, and, and yeah. what response should my life be in, in, pointing people towards Jesus. Do I, do I, and I, those are choices we all get to make. Um, and sometimes I make the wrong decisions and sometimes I make the right ones, but I think those are real choices that we're all making right now, um, in the world. Yeah. So to move from that into the positive, you know, I don't, we can't solve that problem today, (laughs) uh, for people who, you know, think they're being persecuted or, um, whatever else. Um, what is Twitter best at? Like in your mind, what are the opportunities for Christian leaders on a platform like this? If they're maybe they're not using it very much or they're not using it to its full extent. I'm particularly wondering about some of this new stuff that's coming out, the Twitter spaces, some community building stuff. Can you talk to us about, um, I mean, you're the expert at Twitter, but talk, talk to us about what um, the Christian leader might be missing there that is an opportunity yeah um twitter is a conversational platform uh and um you know in in you know many of what i see happening in social media channels and forums is uh it's a broadcast mentality you know it's uh i got a message i'm going to preach it out i'm going to share it out i get lots of likes and lots of follows and i'm just going to broadcast out so it's very one to many um, where Twitter is powerful is that it becomes a conversation, uh, and you know Twitter is what's happening in the world, and so um, it's an amazing channel, and there are tons of incredible Christians and Christian leaders on the platform, but um, uh, you know it's, a, it's an incredible jumping-off point to dip your toe into what's happening in the world, what's happening in culture, and how how should our lens of faith actually help interpret what's happening in the world, and so. Um, so I see, I see that as just an amazing thing, uh, an amazing opportunity for Christian leaders to engage in a dialogue. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we all know this when, you know, when Jesus walked around the, the earth, he was, he was talking to people. Um, he was, it wasn't just one to many, he was having conversations. And so that's, that is where Twitter is the best. That is our superpower. It's a conversational platform where you can, put something out into the world, a question, and you can get millions of people that will actually engage and then you can actually talk back and forth some of our new products that are coming down the road actually allows you to do that uh, through your voice through audio twitter spaces which is uh, which is a new 
um, product that's coming um, allows us to listen in on conversations that are being you know that are occurring uh, and so I think it just presents the ability to tap into conversations that matter to people right in this moment so that's what I get excited about is that it does not have to be a broadcast medium uh, one to many it can be actually you know one to one or it can be you know a, a very vocal dialogue about things that are going on in the world and you know um, that's that's powerful and I think um, when you actually it also can be a very powerful listening platform understanding people's perspective and where they're coming from and what how the world is processing and digesting and you know experiencing an, an issue or a topic so um, so that's what I mean I would like to see more of that I would like to see more Christian leaders engage in dialogue engage in conversation mm -hmm. not just put a post out set it and forget it but you're actually engaging with people on on an issue that matters um, that requires time um, but uh, but that's that's where Twitter is is really powerful yeah, I hear you talking about conversation as opposed to broadcasting. I think a lot of a lot of leaders and certainly in the church, limited time, a limited understanding of the power of a platform, they use it like a megaphone. I'm going to announce this thing to the world and it might be, you know, there's a an event on Saturday at 7 p.m. or here's my thought or opinion about this thing. Goodbye. Set it and forget it as you've said. Um um, but the, the power of the community, the connecting, the interaction back and forth. Um, what are some things related to that that you're seeing is actually working to grow a platform? So in 2021, um, I'll say this of myself, like, <laughs> truth be told, I have a Twitter account that um, is fairly neglected um, because there's so many platforms and it can be overwhelming. You got to get back on it. You got to get back on it. You got to get back on it. I got to tell you, 2021, if if there was ever a year to make it intriguing to me as a user, a passive user, is um, um, there's so much going on now. Um, and I'm a reader, actually, probably more than more than I have ever been before. I'm reading Twitter. I'm not posting much, but I am reading it. Um, but if someone wants to grow, I mean, it's a classic question, perhaps, but grow a following or grow in influence on Twitter. Um what are some things you're seeing that are working? Because, I mean, the strategies when I did this 10 years ago are probably not the strategies today. Maybe some of them are. Um, what are you seeing working? If a pastor saying, I'm going to commit to giving some time to this, to Twitter in 2021, um, what, what would you say they should do? Beyond, okay, we need a conversation, but what does that, what does that mean? Or what, what could that look like? Or do you have a, an account you want to point people at? Check out what they're doing because it's really great. Yeah, um, I think um, there are a lot of things I could suggest here. Uh, I would say that um, you get into with anything in life, you get into it, you get out of it what you put into it. And I would say for, for a lot of people, we, we run our social media um, platforms uh, based off efficiency. You know, how do, how do we actually get something out into the world in the most efficient way possible. And I, I understand that. There's a practicality to that. That makes total sense. Um, but I would say where I've seen Twitter really powerful, good example is Tim Keller, um, who is very active on Twitter. Um, he'll post some very controversial things and he'll get a bunch of people that do not like what he posts. Uh, now, as an author of a video or a piece of content where you're getting a lot of conversation around it, um, it is open and it is public. And what, what Tim does that's brilliant is he doesn't actually just delete it or just walk away. He actually engages. And mm -hmm. especially people who have differing opinions of him. And he actually will have a, I've seen Tim actually run countless back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. conversations with people who just totally disagree with his point of view. Uh, and it's just loaded with grace um, very thoughtful, and it's just exciting to see and be a part of it. Um, to know that you can actually have a conversation with someone, I think that's what makes it super powerful. Um, so the way to answer your question, I would say, is the way to to get the most out of Twitter and to actually build a following is to actually go into that with the mindset of participation, um, participating in other people's conversations and participating 
actually facilitating conversations where others can participate in. Um, again, so many people want to broadcast an opinion. Um, but what if you have a question and you just want to hear people's perspective? Um, you know, Twitter is a great place to actually have a, you know, I am not sure about this. What do you think? And I've done that many times where I'll, I'll just pose a question on Twitter and I'll get hundreds and sometimes thousands of people just like responding to this is what I think this is what and a lot of times it's just a beautiful patchwork quilt of opinions and it's a great dialogue and look I, I think candidly in today's world where arguably we are more device there's so much division on so many different sides of the political aisle um, even in the faith community there are so many different divisions and political and like um, separations and so I think Having open, transparent, respectful dialogue that's loaded with grace and with tons of compassion, I think that's a really powerful uh, format to, you know, to actually begin to understand why do people believe what they believe? Why do people think the way they think? And why do people you know, um, conduct themselves the way they do? Let's, let's talk about those things. And so, so much of what we're doing, we are just screaming at the world thoughts, ideas, opinions. There are so many opinions. We are like swimming in opinions. Um, I would love to just talk to people and just listen. And so Twitter can be a really good platform to do that. Um, and you don't have to have all the answers, which I think I'm also learning. And I think Twitter is a place where you can, you can come in with like wrestling with this thing. Not sure about this. What, what do you think? Um, but like anything in life, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. And if people just want to Again, post something, walk away, and hope hope they build a following. It just it's, that's not going to work. Um, you have to you have to engage. You have to lean in. You have to start a conversation. You have to engage in conversations. And people that do that well um, have unbelievably powerful followings. So I think that that would just be a few a few thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I continue to hear this theme. I hope people who are are checking out the podcast are hearing this theme. Listening. And grace, our grace-filled listening uh, seem to be phrases or themes that you keep coming back to. Um, and like what a, actually a significant posture and how contrary to, you know, I mean, we're, in, we're at a point where the word evangelical, for example, is a word that I hesitate to use because it's politically loaded. And it has, for me, a lot of connotations that I don't want to associate myself with. And so, uh, and those aren't grace-filled listening conversations. Those are aggressive, you know, where's the fruit of the spirit here <laughs> kinds of conversations, you know, angry people accusing each other, just like some really ugly stuff, um, is going on. Hey, can I, but, can I say, sorry, can I say, sorry to interrupt you. Can I say, I, I actually think, and this may be, uh, maybe an unfair statement, but, but we Christians can sometimes be the worst offenders on social media, yeah. you know, yeah. very quick to judge, very quick with our opinions, very slow to listen sometimes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen it so many times where, and we see it on Twitter, we see it on Instagram, we see it on Facebook, where there's this push for rightness. Um, and that could be theological, that could be doctrine based, that could be um, on any number of issues. And it's this this pursuit of being right and someone else is wrong. And I, I just don't know if that reflects humility or the heart of God. Um, and so I, th I do think, I do think your comment about just grace, how do you actually approach social media with grace? Uh, and if some, it's also when someone's wrong on social media, you know, <laughs> like we, 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 we hold them for, with a pretty high bar, you know, apologies are not enough you know it's too little or too late you know we're yeah. we're pretty we don't have a lot of grace well cancel um, culture some of these... right you mess yeah. up yeah it's over your career is done yeah 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 and i do i do think though like again how how do we be like jesus in any situation in these situations and you know if far too often that that sort of beautiful loving grace-fueled image of of Jesus um, doesn't doesn't really get translated in our online personas, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it's that easy to hide behind your phone, easy to hide behind even a false account that doesn't have your name attached to it. You know, there's so there's so much that can happen, and yet I continue to believe so much good. It's why Word Made Digital exists is to celebrate 
and be thoughtful uh, and strategic about the good side of digital. Of course, the Apostle Paul, you know, I've, in so many conversations I have with churches, especially uh, leaders who are concerned about some of the dark sides of the internet. <laughs> and there are some, there are very real dark things. But, um, you know, the Apostle Paul going into the marketplace uh, was he went there because it's where people hung out. And there would have Mm -hmm. been criminal activity and probably some prostitution and human trafficking and sketchy things going on, like injustice towards the poor all around him in this literal market. And he's there because that's where the people are. Um, So you can go into these spaces without having to, um, um, I mean, you're going to expose yourself to some of the stuff, but without having to be like it, or you don't have to become it. Um, where I think the kind of the tone of what we've been talking about is feels very, we haven't used the word, but like evangelizing as in like trying to reach people for Jesus, you know, show yourself as salt and light, show yourself as um, the fruits of the spirit online. But I'm curious around the discipleship stuff. So not just, not just changing someone's mind about faith, but actually growing in faith. Are you seeing anything or are there any opportunities with Twitter? Um, to to not just have again an argument to change someone's mind, but a way that someone could learn a new thing or grow and expand themselves in a topic they're already interested in. Um, like maybe like what what's Tim Keller doing that would lean less evangelism, more discipleship? Yeah, I think um, you know in in social media. So I mean, the way I would think about that is that you're you're there's got to be multiple ways and multiple channels that you are um, building your discipleship. And, and it cannot be just from one source or, or just a couple sources, nor can it just be from one channel. And so, uh, so I do think your ability to have a, a well-balanced, um, you know, uh, your, the voices that are actually, you're feeding yourself, your media diet, um, you need to be super intentional with with sort of the voices that you're allowing um, to be influencing your heart and your mind. And, you know, um, the, the whole idea of guarding your heart, I think, is an important idea right now. You know, what what are you allowing into your soul? <laughs> and so I do think that um, as it relates to discipleship, making people disciples of Christ, um, building your faith. Uh, and going deeper. Um, I think social media has a role to play in that. Um, but I think, I don't think that, I don't think that'll be the primary mechanism where discipleship will take place. Uh, for me, um, social media is a great, uh, a great way to get a perspective on a topic, to see how people of faith are interpreting the world around them, uh, are interpreting an issue of the day um, with a faith, faith-based lens. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that that will never take the place of, you know, my quiet time with, with God. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, where, where we actually start to look like him, where we start to become like him, where we start to, um, you know, be in a world where we are, uh, you know, equipped to go fight the battles of the day. Um, this is just, you know, those, those quiet moments in those mornings where you are just in solid prayer, trying to get to know God better. Um, I think social media can help point you to that, maybe provoke some new thinking, open you up to different points of view. Um, but I don't think anything can take the place of, of, of knowing him, like spending time with him. Uh, and that's, I think what I've been challenged with a lot is, you know, the devil wants to distract and wants to deceive and wants to, you know, give you all these other things to preoccupy. Um, and you can, on YouTube, you can go down a rabbit hole of video content, uh, depending on the topic that you're interested in. And you will get algorithms that will, you know, keep you, keep you in that topic uh, um, and will, may not expose you to new topics. But I would say, um, you know, spending time <laughs> uh, with God in quiet. Um, Nothing can replace that. And so that's, for me anyway, that's where I've really found discipleship to really start to take place, spending time with with people, um, community, 
uh, actually understanding and getting into God's word. I mean, you know, social media is wonderful. And I work for a company where I think I learned so much about uh, what it means to be a person of faith in today's world from the platform, but it does not come close to, you know, that, that morning quiet time with, with God, the father. So, um, yeah, that would, that would just be my take. So you're kind of circling around it. There's this idea I want to get to with you around addiction to digital, um, which I think is a discipleship issue, a spiritual formation issue for the Christian that our phones are so addictive. Um, there's always another YouTube video. There's always another story to view. There's always another tweet. And in the past, there was always another Donald Trump tweet. <laughs> uh, so what do you do? I mean, I, I think a lot of people who are listening to this, they live in a world where social media and, and digital content is a part of their professional life. Um, so it's, it's like someone who will say like, ah, you may be ha maybe at Twitter, you're happy when people say this, like, oh, I hate Facebook. I'm not on Facebook anymore. And for me, I think, well, nice to be you. I need these kinds of platforms for my professional life. So a lot of people listening are in that kind of a position where they social media, Twitter and Instagram and all these platforms are part of their, their work. It's, it's, a, it's your literal work. How do you create separation or how do you put the phone down? What advice might you give to someone, you know, maybe on the honest journey of, of digital addictions? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And let's be honest, like these addictions are real and it's an addiction that I think, um, sometimes we, we're, we're afraid to call it an addiction. Um, but it is, it is a very real uh, compulsion for it's the modern day cigarette, you know, like you have to mm -hmm. go, uh, you have to go check your phone every once in a while. Um, or if you've ever lost your phone uh, or forgotten it and gone someplace, it, you, when you feel your heart sink and that sort of mild sort of sense of panic set in, uh, you know, you might have a problem. Um, I only know this because it's happened to me and I felt that way. <laughs> and so, um, I don't know what that's like, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. Um, but but this is there are very real human side effects and impacts to, I think, um, you know, our digital life um, and screen time. I think COVID, if nothing else, like we are all on screens all the time. And so um, our screen time has just gone through the roof. And so, um, you know, who knows 20 years down the road what the like the societal and psychological implications of this unbelievably unprecedented screen time will be. But um, but I think a lot of this is just, um, uh, you know, a way for us to, like anything in life, um, money, a career, a spouse, uh, you know, um, a nice title, um, social media. If we are trying to find our identity through any of these other things, it's a, it's just a massive false, you know, it's a red herring. It's a false reality. You will never, you will never find your identity in those things. And so I think the risk for Christians in this world that we're in is that we, we try and find our identity in our online personas, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's people coming to social media for validation that yes, I am worthy and yes, I am valuable. And if I get a hundred likes on this post, then, then ugh, finally, I know that I actually have some self-worth. Um, and I, I think that's just a super dangerous place to be in. I know there is this unbelievable dopamine hit that we get when we post on Instagram or, you know, that when you actually get people to comment and like on your content, you feel good about it. Um, and but then as soon as it slips into a territory where we are putting our hope in that thing to tell us who we are, uh, I think that starts to get into a dangerous place and it becomes a distraction. And maybe it's maybe it's as simple as that. It's nothing more than a distraction from uh, from our time with God. Um, and God is constantly our entire lives are spent trying to figure out who we are <laughs> and who we are in God. And God is constantly telling us, "Let me tell you who you are. Let me let me remind you who you are, um, and let me remind you who you're becoming and who I've created you to be." And all of these things that emerge in our life and that push through the floor and start taking our eyes off of that are, are you know, 
the, the, the colossal great distractions of our day. And so I, I do think we are called to just really, you know, guard our heart um, and, and remind ourselves, you know, what, what are we hoping for and what are we doing? And, you know, people who go on these digital detox, who, who you know, quit Instagram, quit, quit Facebook, quit Twitter for a, for a long period of time, you know, I have yet to see someone who's done that to say that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, every person that I've seen that have actually gone through a digital detox have said, it actually put my life into perspective. Um, mm -hmm. It actually allowed me to just recalibrate who I am. Um, and so I think that the great risk for us as a society, for us as a people, and, you know, for, for Christians today is that we get so consumed with uh, the world around us and what other people think, and we stop becoming concerned about what God thinks and who we're becoming in him. Um, you know, it's, it's a very slippery slope. So that, that would be, that would be just a obvious sort of observation based on your question, but it is an addiction. Let's not, let's not try and kid ourselves. It's a very real addiction and we just need to, we need to call it that because it is that. Yeah. Well, it's, if you were an AA Alcoholics Anonymous, the first step, I mean, in my basic understanding, the first step is you have to admit you have a problem. And so if we can't call it an addiction, if we can't name it that way, it's very difficult to to make some changes um, to protect ourselves from it if we don't think it's an addiction at all. We have to first acknowledge that it is one. Um, as a maybe a last question or the last big idea I want to address is around faith and work. I love through this whole conversation as I'm getting to know you, the way you think about your work through a lens of your of your faith. Um, and I, I think that general statement, a lot of churches, because they're run by professional pastors, <laughs> uh, they haven't done a great job in this in this conversation of helping their people who go to normal jobs every day, how to integrate their work with their faith. Um, so maybe is there anything you wish the church would address about this? Or is there an encouragement you have to people listening who that's their world? They do not work in a Christian ministry setting, um, they're bringing their faith to their regular life with them. What would you say to, to that question? Yeah, well, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, sometimes I think it's tempting for Christians to point to the church, quote unquote, um, and what does the church need to do to address this thing? Um, I often think, you know, like, look, we are the church. Uh, we we mm -hmm. are we are the church and we are called to go out and preach the gospel and, you know, um, share God's love with the world. And so, um, so I take a little bit of accountability on that. And how do I, how does it manifest in, inside the work? You know, what, what should it, what should it look like? Um, and it, it, um, I don't know that it's obvious, but I, I would say that you know, I used to think to, to be a, to be a good Christian, you had to recite the Bible. <laughs> you had to have verses on hand at every moment. You had to get people to come to church. You had to convert them. Um, you need like that footprints image and poem beside your desk, you know, that with Jesus yeah. and the footprints on the beach. That should be beside well, all Christians' desks. <laughs> yeah, and and that poem's not even in the Bible anywhere, you know. And it, <laughs> it's it's the, these are these are these are things where it's like the to be a Christian meant you had to go do these things. And although I do agree, we are called to go out and, and bec not only just preach the gospel, but become what it says. I, I think, you know, we, we were designed to, as you know, the creator of the universe designed us in his image. Um, and in Genesis, he talks about you are designed in my image. And he also talks about go forth and multiply. And for a long period of time, I used to think go forth and multiply was was a lot about having babies <laughs> and procreation, you know, but but what I really have come to learn is that go forth and multiply is is really about multiplying the image of God in our life, multiplying, um, you know, and God is a lot of things, but mostly he's love. And so how do we actually manifest love in our world? How do we how do we um, embody that in how we deal with people? In, the, in a professional setting, uh, I would say it's, it's very easy to separate faith and work. 
It's very easy to have, I have my faith life and I have my work life. And um, I, I've always felt that that just felt, that felt to me very uh, inauthentic, but I also don't want to come across as this preachy, you know, you know, street corner preacher trying to get everyone to believe or else they're going, you know, going to hell, you know, like this is, this is not an effective uh, communication uh, strategy inside the workforce. And so, so what do I do? I, I, I think like, you know, and maybe this is simple, but um, loving people like Jesus did to me is great theology. Um, and so how do you lead people with that? How do you truly love people in a way that it's not about you? Um, we are putting the self aside, um, selfish motivations, selfish, selfish desires, um, we are, and we are putting people first. And I think when you lead in a professional setting where love is the filter by which you interact with other people, uh, it tends to unlock some really powerful things. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, there is a place to talk about faith in the workforce. I do think there is a place to talk about the gospel in the workforce. And you know, people might say, how could you possibly think about that? That is like, there's no way I could actually talk about a Bible verse. Um, I, I post on Twitter all the time, um, you know, biblical verses, you know, and I, I'm getting more comfortable <laughs> doing that. Um, we actually established something at Twitter called Twitter Faith. And Twitter Faith, um, you know, we are in a season of acceptance. We are in a season of diversity. And, you know, if depending on your lifestyle and what you believe, um, acceptance is a is a very real theme at the corporate level. Um, all all thought and all sort of people and all races and all sexes and all sort of um, sexual orientation, all of you, all those backgrounds should be accepted. Um, and and I think I think if you were to add the word and loved uh, in that as well, um, mm. it's a great philosophy and um, and faith should be a part of that. So depending on your faith background, um, you should be comfortable. And this is the belief at Twitter that we've established. Faith should be no different. You should be able to come to work and talk about your faith. Um, you don't need to change someone. You don't need to convert people. Um, but you should feel totally accepted and comfortable talking about your faith in the workplace. And so we have a group at Twitter called Twitter Faith. We get together, um, you know, every other week as a group. And it's people from all over the world who have a faith-based wow. background. Um, and we talk about, you know, what's going on in the world, what's going on in our company. Um, you know, when we... When we made some big political decisions to ban some big political figures, we got together and we talked about it. Um, we actually get together and pray for our leadership, uh, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, like, it's an amazing thing. And I, yeah, I, I, I think often, um, like the story of Esther, when Esther, uh, you know, was in this situation where she was, she was in a moment where she had the power to influence and save a generation and save a nation. Um, I often think about that. Um, and you know, often people, Christian, Christians come to me and say, why do you work at Twitter? You know, like it's such a, like they're censoring people. And, and I don't believe that actually, but I, I, mm. I, I do think that um, God has put me here for a reason. I don't necessarily know what that is, but I am trying to listen and trying to be attentive to what he's trying to say to me in this season. and just be a, a voice uh, inside this organization and on this platform for him. And so mm -hmm. um, to me, that's super exciting. Um, it's exciting to be in that moment where, you know, we're having these conversations, it's open and, um, you know, I'm not trying to win arguments. I'm not trying to be right. I'm just trying to show people that, hey, you know, God's love is an amazing thing. And if you actually consider that there is a creator of the universe, that there is something beyond ourselves, beyond our screens, beyond the world, the digital world that we're living in, and that we recognize that there is power in Jesus. Uh, and if you just were open to that idea, um, unbelievable, miraculous, and powerful things could be made real for your life. And so um, that all starts, and candidly why I work for Twitter, that all starts with a conversation. Uh, and so that's, mm -hmm. that's my hope, is that we could be a platform that starts a conversation, uh, and starts a conversation about the amazing redemptive power of Christ Jesus. And if we could do that, if we could change things, if we could actually make that happen in a more healthy way, what a wonderful, what a wonderful mission to be a part of. So that's how I think. 
Paul, uh, I love it. I'm really um, encouraged through our conversation. You're thoughtful, um, intelligent, and very reasonable in your views. <laughs> I mean, you're just a, you're just a level headed approach, which is what we need. And I'm so grateful for the position um, that you're in. Um, you know, people listening, would you pray for Paul and people like him, people of Christian influence in digital platforms? Um, there are people like Paul in every organization, and we need to um, pray for them who make to help make these decisions that affect millions or even billions of people. Um, Paul, if people want to find you on Twitter, how do they find you? You can follow me at Paul Burns, P-A-U-L-B-U-R-N-S, and I'll awesome. follow you back. <laughs> Paul, uh, thanks so much for, for being on the podcast. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, Joanna.